God forbid, like Canada or like Tennessee or something. Like, <laughs> like heck no! Like I went to Africa, I'm not going to Canada. You know what? Like, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> and I began to test that I'm getting comfortable. Something inside of me is saying, but walking on water was nice. I remember what it was like to sink a few times, so thank God I'm within the call and everything's okay. That's not right either. And that's something that we have to know whether you're in the stage or not in the stage, because I really want this retreat to apply to all walks of life, to, to the newest believers, to the mature. You still have to be seeking calls within the call because God is always leading. Of course, there's so many parts to the story of getting out of the boat, looking at the storm, the wind, the waves, Jesus walking, the ghosts, Peter sinking. But the greatest part of the story is that Peter walked on water. And he knew that the joy and the freedom of experiencing God's power after taking a huge risk. What I want you guys to know is that getting out of the boat <coughs> was Peter's great gift to Jesus. But the experience of walking on water was Jesus' great gift to Peter. So, it's a mutual offering to each other. Again, that's what I was talking about in our liturgical life. We offer and we receive. We offer and we receive. And that's just the life of God. You have to understand this part. But again, I know a lot of us love to hear the stories about people walking on water and the great experiences that people have. We love to hear the stories and hear the information of how to get there, but the information has no power in it. If you enjoy the talks, if you put smiley faces on the notes, if you did all that stuff, that's great. But the information is not enough. In order for a transformation to take place, certain actions and experiences are required. <coughs> the perfect example of this is when Moses died and the people were wondering if God was going to continue to take care of him, the great Moses. Something you have to know about Moses is that Moses would just like climb the mountain, go into the cloud, and disappear for 40 days and come down. He would climb up the mountain, go into the cloud, lead us, part the Red Sea, do the miracles. And when Moses died, they got to a point where they were like, what's next? And God, if you ever read John, Joshua chapter 1, there's a theme of be strong and, and of good and of be, be strong and of courage. Of good courage. Have courage and be trusting in the Lord and be strong and courageous before God. It keeps on repeating over and over and over again. And God told Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. But like Joshua had never done what Moses had done. Joshua was, you might have heard like, if you've ever been to any of my like, there's like, Joshua was like the Shanta guy of Moses. Like he holds the Shanta behind him. Moses, you know, remember a bishop comes into the church, there's a guy holding the bishop Shanta. He's the most important person in the church after the bishop. <laughs> Joshua was the Shanta guy. He's just holding the Shanta, walking behind, the, you know, Moses, and just following Moses' lead. And now God is telling Joshua, you, as I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. Me? I'm just a Shanta guy. And you see Shanta guys throughout the whole Bible. Elisha was the Shanta guy of Elijah. The Bible says he was the one that used to wash the hands of Elijah. Like, what's the big deal of a guy that washes hands? Like, what's so special about that guy? But Elisha became greater than Elijah in his words. But the first step that Joshua was going to experience in being, that God would be with him like he was with Moses, was in Joshua chapter 3. It says, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. Let me give you some background. So, they're like, 
at the border of the promised land. That's it. They're there. And then what happens? They come and they find River Jordan. The dead stop. Well, Moses was the guy that used to part the Red Sea. Like, if Moses was with us, no problem. Stick the rod in and do your magic, Moses, we're good. Now Joshua was going to have to do the same trick. And this is what God is commanding him. He says, As soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. Something you have to understand about this story. They're carrying the ark of the Lord. Joshua's got the priests. Is that all right, guys? This is what you're going to do. You're holding the ark of the Lord. It's very heavy. It wasn't just like a small little bucket. Like it was like a big box. Okay, it's huge. You're going to step inside the Jordan. The Jordan is not a stream. The Jordan, in the same passage, it says, would overflow at this time of year. So the Jordan was very, very, very deep. It's like a, it's like, it's like a ocean. It's deep. Okay? And all of a sudden, he says, okay, just put your feet in. And they put my feet in. It's deep. It's like, like neck high. They get in. They're holding the ark. The ark is very sacred. Nobody can drop it. They get inside. They put their feet in the water. <clears throat> you want to know what happens? The waters of this river stopped 19 miles of the road. So imagine, they put their feet in, they're thinking, Moses, put the rod, everything happened beautifully. They put their feet in, and it says, in the city of Adam. If you study it, Adam is 19 miles up the road, that's where the water stopped. So they're holding the ark in the river, and the water is just flowing down as they're holding the ark. And they're like, Moses, Joshua, like, what's going on? Like, we're going to die here. And they're waiting, and they're waiting. And their waiting started to get less and less and less, and the water passed them up, and they were standing on dry ground. But the most important thing you have to understand is that I need to take the first step. How can I know whether I'm getting out of the boat <coughs> in any area of my life? Ask yourself, what am I doing that I could not do apart from the power of God? What is going on in your life today? What are you doing in your life today that you could not do apart from the power of God? If you were to ask Peter this, he would say, I cannot walk on water on my own. I cannot do this on my own. This is something that is impossible to me. Have you ever looked back at a point in your life that there was a huge struggle, a huge trial in your life, and you look back and you say, I don't know how I ever got through that. Sometimes people come and they sit with me and they say, Buddha, like, that's it, tomorrow's the day of my death. Like, I'm not, like, this is, I'm going to get kicked out of school, my job is going to get, I'm going to get fired from my job, whatever. They have these huge trials in front of them, and I come and talk to them like a month later, I'm like, you're alive. Yeah, I don't know how it happened. Those are times in your life that could not have worked or been effective apart from the power of God. Is there any challenge in your life right now that is large enough that you have no hope of doing it apart from God's help? Ask yourself that question. It's very relevant to what we're going to talk about this evening. Is there any challenge in your life right now that is large enough that you have no hope of doing it apart from God's help. Think about this for a second. I'll ask it one more time. Is there any challenge in your life right now that is large enough that you have no hope of doing it apart from God's help? If not, you are seriously under-challenged. Your life is seriously under-challenged. And that is where you don't grow. That is where your maturity comes to a halt. What are you doing in your life where you need the power of God? Where you need His grace, you need His support, and you need Him to work in you. What are you doing in your life? Because if you don't need Him, you're not living the right life. 
You're not living the life that God expected you and wants you to live and dreams for you to live. If you want to, <coughs> if you want to walk on the water, you have to be willing to get your feet wet first. God helps people's faith grow by asking them to take the first step. There's a special time in the life of Moses when he was called, where I believe that he took the first step of water running. You see, Moses' God was breaking Moses down for 40 years in the wilderness. So he was in the palace, Pharaoh, living in the palace as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Okay? He's living in the palace, getting the best education, living the nicest life, having everything perfect, and all of a sudden, we know the story, he kills the Egyptian, flees to the desert and spends 40 years there. Well, at the end of the 40 years, he sees the burning bush, and God calls him to do something that is very different. He says, I want you to set my people free out of the land of Egypt. You see, God in those 40 years had been breaking down the self, the ego of Moses. 40 years. So that Moses came before God and he's like, I got nothing. I can't do it. If you would have asked me 40 years ago, when I was in the palace and I was powerful and educated and all this stuff, now I'm just a simple shepherd walking in the desert. I don't know anything. And God is calling Moses to walk on water. And he starts making all these excuses. I can't do it. I have a heavy tongue. So God asks him to do something. <coughs> he asks him to take a small step. He says what? Throw down your staff. Throw down your staff. We know that Moses threw it down and immediately became a serpent. <coughs> At the time, serpents used to be worshipped in Egypt and they were, of course, regarded as very poisonous, very dangerous. And then what he tells him, God tells him, okay, throw down your staff and it turns into a snake. snake. That's not the hard part. He says, pick it up by the tail. Let's say you're Moses. You're Moses. Ladies. God tells you, Throw down your purse. <laughs> and it turns into a snake skin leather. No, I'm just kidding. It turns into a snake. <laughs> it turns into a snake. And you're like, wow, that was a cool trick, God. I give you my purse back. Okay, pick it up from the tail. Let's say you had to pick up the snake and you decided, I'll pick up the snake. Where are you going to pick up the snake from? The tail? Heck no! Like, no way! If I get the tail, what's gonna happen? Shh! And the cobra's gonna bite my hand. God asked Moses to snake from the tail that he would learn how to rely on it. Number one, he would understand this is the first step principle. Moses discovered God's faithfulness. But Moses had to pick it up first. What's the first step that you need to take in your life? I want you to think about, like, maybe as you've been taking your quiet times and discussions, you realize there's something lurking in your head, and you're like, no, no, not that one. Like, of course, God doesn't mean that. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> that thing that you're saying, no, 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 of course, God doesn't mean that. God is much bigger than that. But uh, it's like, He's not going to bring it down to this. Come on. And so I'm waiting for something better. That step. That one here, that step. That's the one that God is saying, pick it up by the tail. This was the beginning for Moses. Over and over in scripture, this pattern is repeated. Put the rod in the Red Sea. It happens. Naaman the Syrian, he was a leprous, and I talked about him earlier, that he was a great commander in the Syrian army. And he said, if you want to cleanse yourself from leprosy, you got to dip yourself in the Jordan. He's like, come on, you have much nicer rivers in Syria. I'm going to dip myself in this dump. Like, there's no way this nasty water I'm going to dip. He says, if you want to be cleansed, you got to do it seven times. He didn't feel like he was ready to take the first step of obeying that the leprosy would be cleansed. In the feeding of the five loaves and the two fish, 
You gotta take it, and you gotta pass out the five loaves. And I want you to imagine you are the disciples. Five loaves and two fish divided among twelve disciples. So everybody gets about four pieces this big. And then Jesus says, okay, we have 5,000 people divided in groups of 50. That's how many groups? How many groups? 10 groups. Times 3, 30 groups. 30 groups of 50. That's how much? 1,500. So it's not that. It's 15,000. Times 10. So everybody had 300 groups. And here I have four pieces of bread. Oh, I get those 300 groups. Hey, then. Like, come on. And they're going with my four pieces of bread. And I'm starting to pass it out. And the bread doesn't increase until I give out the bread. I got to give out the bread and the pieces of fish for it to increase. I have to take the first step. I have to take it from the hand of Jesus. He commands me to give to the people. He gives it to me in my hand, and I go and I start passing out. And as I pass out, I discover what? It's increasing. Gideon, in order for him to overcome the Midianites, he had a very hard mission. God had given him 32,000 soldiers, and they were going to fight. I forgot the number. I think it was 100,000 soldiers. 32,000 against 100,000? All right, God, we need your power. God says, you want my power? 32,000 is a little too much. Can you bring it down to 300? I said, hey, so we're going to kill ourselves now. And he begins. This is how you're going to do it with the whole getting on your knees and the people drinking the water like dogs. Like, and he starts filtering, and I got 300 little guys to fight against 100,000. But it was then that I could discover the victory of the Lord. You have to take the first step. That's going to be given by acting... <coughs> in faith and trusting in God. We're going to discover how faith grows. I believe an important reason God often asks us to take a first step is that it has to do with the nature of faith. The way that faith works. Okay, so we're going to kind of discover how faith works. The first thing is that you never try to have more faith, you just get to know God better. What do I mean? Everybody, usually at retreats or in sermons, you hear and you have this plan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do. What happens? It just takes about 36 hours and we're waiting for the next retreat in nine months for us to get refreshed again. Why? Because I'm planning on doing you're not going to do anything. You can do nothing apart from God. And so in order to grow in faith, you have to grow in your knowledge of God. We're talking about knowledge in the Bible means intimate experience with God, like Adam knew Eve. That's how my faith grows. <laughs> not by tomorrow I'm going to go you know, jump on a moving bus, or I'm going to do, do whatever activity that I have in my mind. No, that's not how faith grows. Faith grows by pursuing God in an intimate, covenantal relationship to follow Him in a deeper way. And because God is faithful, the better you know Him, <coughs> the more you're going to trust Him. The way to get to know His trustworthiness is to risk obeying Him, like we talked about in the last time, obedience. Risk obeying Him, like Abraham. Abraham took the risk of leaving his land. He took that first step of saying, all right, I'm leaving the land, and I'm going to go to a land that God will show me, which I have no idea what it's going to look like. He took the first step. And he began in his experience to taste the sweetness of God through his life of worship, which we talked about last time. That life of worship thing is not a point. It is the point. Last time, we put worship as one of the points. The life of worship is the point in which I will get to know God. You have to have a life of worship. You have to have a committed, deep experience of worshiping God. That every day, I will rise, I will worship. Every time before I go to sleep, I will worship. And throughout the day, I'm going to worship. Physically, 
through my prayer, through my beta, my matanias, through taking communion, through reading the word of God, all that stuff. But it's an attitude. It's an attitude that we have to have. The way to get to know his trustworthiness is to risk obeying him. The first way is expanding your spiritual comfort zone. Most of us have this area in our hearts that is like good enough. Like with God, this is good enough. Something I didn't tell you about the life of Abraham. When Abraham left his father's house and his land, he was going and he was supposed to go to a land that God would tell him to stop here. But he said he stopped in a land called Haran. H-A-R-A-N. Haran. <coughs> and he stayed in Haran until his father died. And we don't know how long it is, but some people say it was close to maybe 10 years that he was staying in Haran. He was living in Haran for 10 years and he never got to the place that God showed him because you want to know what happened? Abraham took his father with him. God told him, leave your father's house. Abraham couldn't leave the father. He took the father with him. He kept on going and he got to Haran. And I imagine the people around him told him, come on, this is good enough. How many of you got to a certain point in your spiritual life where this is good enough? Like, we're not going to be fanatics, right? We're not going to become a monk. So this is good enough. And so Haran, uh, Abraham spent 10 years in Haran, and that's not the place that God wanted him. All because his father was with him, and his family was with him, and they probably got to a point because it wasn't their call, that they said, we left our land, we left everything, Haran is good enough. This is safe enough. You want to know what's at Haran? On the other side of Haran, so Haran was bordered by a river, Euphrates. And the other side was Shechem, which was where the land that God wanted him. In order for him to get to <coughs> Shechem, he had to cross the river. There was no ferry at the time to carry that you know, luxury car. To get like it was very difficult to have to take all your possessions, your cattle and everything, to cross a river. What happens when you cross the river? What happens when you cross the river? There's no going back. There's no going back. And so I cross the river and it's good enough. Why? Because once I get to the other side of the river, that's it, I'm not going back. So what do I do? I get as close to the river as possible and I say, this is good enough. How many of you are doing that in your spiritual life? You're stuck in Haran. But God never wanted you in Haran. Haran is nothing. There's nothing in Haran. That's not the place that God leads you. That's your spiritual comfort zone. You want to know what happened? If you read Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Abraham. Or, yeah, it says, God spoke to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country. So he heard the voice of God. He obeyed. He left the land, got to Haran, stuck there for a long time, and then there's the what? There's the river. When Abraham crossed the river after his father died, he was like moved on with the calling of God. Verse 7 it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham. There's a difference between the Lord said to Abraham and the Lord appeared to Abraham. If you want to get to the point in your life where you are walking on water, it's one thing to hear the voice of God, it's another thing to see God face to face. There is a level of experience with God when you cross over the river. When you jump over the river and enter into that place where God dwells. The Lord appeared to him. I'll give you examples. Maybe you might be comfortable, you might be comfortable giving Sunday school lessons. Maybe many of you guys are Sunday school teachers. But what if I told you, okay, this Sunday you're getting the Sunday sermon. Probably, <laughs> like, Sunday school's good enough. Why? Because 
It's comfortable. You've made it comfortable enough. I can do my plagiarism of, of the, you know, less than the, from his other diocese. It's coming. What about you going on and on? Or, I can go out of my comfort zone and experience what it means to be used by God. Maybe you might feel comfortable enough to pray with people that you're close to. But maybe you're not comfortable enough to confront somebody about something that they're doing wrong that you're close to. Right? We can have a nice Bible study. We can share in a song and clap. Right? We can do all these things. But what happens when somebody in the group is doing something wrong? Is that within your comfort zone? Why don't you know? I'm going to lose my friend. They're not your friend if you don't tell them. You don't love them. So that's my comfort zone. Taking the step saying, Lord, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to step into this where the magic happens and I'm going to speak the truth in love. There are people in my life that when I was younger spoke the truth in love when I needed it. And I like rejected them and I pushed them away. Now I worship them. Now they're my favorite people in the whole world because they spoke the truth in love. They tried to wake me up. They tried to say, like, what you're doing is wrong. And I fought and I made a big hissy fit and I <coughs> made all this like drama when somebody really loved me and said, you gotta wake up. And I promise you, the voice of that person, years before I had actually made the decision to change, was ringing in my ears all the time. And I'll never forget. Somebody went out into where the magic happens, outside of their spiritual comfort zone. You need to get out of the boat a little every day. Begin the day by asking God for wisdom about where you need to get your feet wet that day. We have to do it on a daily basis. I'm going to give you four indicators to know where is God calling you to walk on the water. The first one is the indicator of fear. This is going to help you know about real life water walkers and where to begin. Often God will ask us to step out of the boat at the point of our fears. How many of you as I've been speaking this last couple of days, in these last several talks, those fears are like whispering at me all, all the whole time. Like, uh-uh, not that one. Like this is the world is crazy, but I won't see him after tomorrow, everything will be fine, I'll go back to my normal life. <laughs> What's the place of your feet? That is the indicator that you need to get out of the boat. Ask yourself. I'll tell you my first visitation as a priest. You come back from Egypt, they do a big party for you, and all this stuff, and everything's beautiful. And then like you gotta start working as a priest, like now you gotta get your feet right. And I was serving with two extremely blessed, loved fathers. Everybody's confessing, happy. With it. I'm like the new guy. I don't have anybody. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like from the city. I don't know anything. And so the senior priest gives me a list of the people that don't like the other two priests. <laughs> <laughs> they don't go to church. They don't like Jesus. They don't like the church. They don't like the Buddhas. And he said, like, try. Like maybe you can just call him up, hey, I have a new guy here on time, like, like he's one up busy. <laughs> so Buddha gives me a name, and I call up the name, and I go through my spiel, and I'm praying, I'm like, Lord, get me out of this. Call it like a meeting, do anything. Like, I just want to get out of this awkward situation. I don't know who I'm going to. So I call and say, hi, my name is Buddha Paul. I'm the new priest in the area. You know, I'd love to, I'm getting to know the people. I'd love to come visit you. And Buddha says, be careful, these people, like, they're mad at us because we didn't fix a problem that they needed to fix. So, try them. And these people were a little bit outside the will of God, okay? Let's put it that way. They were outside the will of God. They were living, like, not godly lives. And because they didn't want it to be awkward with me and them, they called all of their friends so that they could just be like this big, like, shade drinking party where we just hang out for an hour, <laughs> get them out the door, and we'll move on to our lives. <laughs> and I remember, like, I'm praying, I'm like, God, what am I going to say to these people? Like, come to the church, don't worry about the other two priests, I'm the best one out of all of them. <laughs> like, what am I going to say? I began to pray, I said, Lord, like, so we get there, and the chief dog, and Egypt, and the revolutions, and all kinds of, like, we're talking about all kinds of, just, small talk. 
And then somebody said something about, it's like it's the end of the world. I felt like God was flashing these big red lights, like, jump in on that. Like, that's, that's how you get in. That's how you cross the river with these people. So I began to say, well, what is the end of the world? What's going to happen at the end of the world? What are you expecting to happen at the end of the world? What if it is the end of the world? What are we going to do? What are you going to do? What am I going to do? I'm afraid. What if it's the end of the world? I don't know. Like, if I'm ready, I'm telling you as a priest, I don't know if I'm ready. End of the world is a very scary time. Maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I'm not right with God. Maybe I don't have... And all of a sudden, we begin to open up conversation and opening up. That night, I took the confessions of every single person that night. I promised you tears of repentance. Because God said, just put your feet out. I know you're a bozo, but I'm the one who's going to work. Just say anything and people are going to come. People will know me. People will love me. People will find me. Just get out on the water. But I'm afraid, Lord. Trust me. Just try it. I was addicted to visitations after that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is the new senior priest of St. Paul Trust. Identify where your fears are. Next thing is the indicator of frustration. When people become frustrated with the brokenness of the world, when you feel like you're frustrated at what's happening in your churches, in your society, at work, with the lost youth at church, when you're frustrated by all that's going on around you and there's this like frustration, that's the place that God is saying, I am frustrated. I'm allowing you to be frustrated. You know, Nehemiah, he had heard that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. And he was frustrated. He wept and he fasted. You know where Nehemiah was at the time? He was living in the palace. So this was a time in Israel, not in Israel. The Jews were taken out of Israel as captives or slaves and brought over to a place of captivity in Babylon. And Babylon was this very luxurious, beautiful place. And after years, people started to get settled and they started to find their place in Babylon. And they forgot they were the people of God that worshipped the temple in Jerusalem. And they moved on with life and things were great. And Nehemiah, as he was the cup bearer in the palace, so he used to bring the cup and he used to have to taste the wine before he would give it to the king. He's the most trusted person in the whole kingdom. He's the most important person because he is the one that would make sure that the king doesn't die. So he's got to be the man. He's in the palace. But when he got a report that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, he wept. He wept and he got on his knees and said, God, like, we can't handle this anymore. I'm confessing my sins and the, the sins of my people. Lord, take us back and build the walls of, your, of Jerusalem again. And he said, when he prayed before God, he said, give me favor in the eyes of this man. Who is this man? The king of the biggest empire in the whole world. Give me favor, as he's speaking to God, in the eyes of this man. Who was this man? Oh, just the most powerful person in the universe. Because he was talking to God. He was frustrated. And he went and said, I want to go back to Jerusalem. And I want to build the walls of Jerusalem. Oh, well, the same walls that you guys broke down. I want to build them. He was frustrated. Are you frustrated by anything in the environment around you? That's the indicator you need to get out of the boat. Where are you frustrated? Where do you feel like there's a challenge? Or there's something that's not right? Or there's something that needs to be changed? Or that God is moving you from within? That is the place. It's the indicator of frustration. You know who also got frustrated? with David. David came out to bring give the beta sandwiches to his brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes... And he brings, and all the armies are like two sides of the valley. Everybody's on their own side of the mountain. And the Israelites are shaking. And David's like, guys, what's going on? They're like, the giants. He's like, who's the giant? David's like, this tall. 
You ever see like that guy that is this tall, but he can take down a giant? That was David. Who's the giant? Oh, that uncircumcised Philistine? Who's he? He said, the people, the guy that's not part of the covenant of God? He said, hey, let him away from me. Like, I'm going to kill him. Let me out. David, how do you look like that? <laughs> he was frustrated. What do you mean that this person is defying the armies of Israel? Let me out. David was frustrated. And he went and he destroyed the lion. One hit. Maybe God is calling you to trust him at some point of frustration in your life. Then there's the indicator of compassion. When's the last time you took a serious compassion risk? Christ did it all the time. Touching lepers. I want you to imagine a leper. One day, man comes home, gives his wife a hug and a kiss, and they're sitting there at dinner playing with the kids, and as he's sitting at the table, he's itching his arm. And then all of a sudden, he's itching the back of his neck. And he's like, maybe what's wrong? I don't know. Like, what's on your hand? Maybe you should go get it checked out. All right, honey, tomorrow after work, I'll go, and I will go check it out. And he goes to work, itching all day, finally goes to the doctor, they say, you have lepers. You can't go home. You're going to get taken from here and to a cage, and we're going to throw you your food, and you're going to have be isolated completely, and we're going to, every time anybody walks by your cage, you're going to say, I'm unclean, get away. And all of a sudden, you're isolated. Your wife, your children have no idea where you are, and you're just stuck in a cage. And somebody walks by, get away, I'm unclean. You're just stuck. And then one man says, get away, I'm unclean. And he walks over and he says, stretch out your hands. And he hadn't been touched, probably God knows how long he touched him. Jesus touched the leper and he healed that leper from that point on. I want you to imagine the transformation in that leper's life. That he was touched by someone that wasn't afraid to have compassion on somebody that was broken. We need more people with sincere compassion, meeting real needs in others. That indicator is when you look to something and you realize something's not right. And this person needs compassion, get your feet right. The indicator of compassion. Maybe it's somebody who's broken, works in your office. Somebody who lives in your neighborhood, somebody, your church, somebody who's, who needs compassion. You are the one. Don't wait for anyone else. Don't call a woman and say, go visit that guy. You are the one. Have compassion. That's the indicator where you need to get out of the boat and take the first step. And the last thing is the indicator of prayer. What are you praying for? What do you feel like? You want to pray for. I was reading a neat story of somebody who was praying for. He decided, I want to pray for Africa because I know there's all kinds of problems in Africa. And he was sitting with another person and said, Well, you're going to pray for all of Africa. Why don't you choose a country? He said, okay, fine, I'll choose Kenya. And he began to pray for Kenya. And he ended up starting like a. Like, I'm going to go to Kenya and see how I can help. And he goes to Kenya. And he begins, he's praying, and he's praying, and he's praying. And he begins to help out. And somehow, he does something great where he's like helping out in the country where the president actually wanted to meet him. And he met the president. And the president brought him to the palace and had a nice dinner because he did something great in Kenya. And as the president was there, he said, let me give you a tour of Kenya, I'd love to show you around. And they went around, he said, oh, this is where the prisons are, and he says, and he says right now there's a, uh, last night we just caught a lot of, or not uh, last night, there, last night there's been a, a lot of, like, storm in the air, like about these political prisoners. And the guy says, well, why don't you just let them free? Let them free. Why do you need to have, like, let them out? And he gets back home. After you know visiting Kenya and doing other things, he gets back home and he gets a call from the State Department. 
I said, yeah, you know, is this Bob? I said, yeah, this is Bob. Were you recently in Kenya? I said, yeah. Were you like with the president of Kenya? I said, yeah, like, long story, like, whatever. Yeah, I was with the president of Kenya. I said, did you say something to the president of Kenya that, like, of significance? I said, about political prisoners? I got nervous. He's like, yeah, I told you, she's like, let him go. <laughs> <laughs> the State Department guy said, that day, the president let out the political prisoners, and they said, we at the State Department have been trying to get those political prisoners set free for years. Because he had been praying for Kenya, and he was praying that Kenya would have this great impact in the country. God was one word, and this great miracle happened. I want to ask you what is on your heart. This is the last point. What is on your heart? What do you feel like you want to pray for? And I want you to commit for a period of time to pray for. What is one thing that you feel like, I'd like to pray for this? I want to be the prayer warrior that prays for this. And commit a certain amount of time, say six months. Say, Lord, I don't know how I'm doing it, but I'm going to pray for a Buddha ball for the next six months every day. We're doing 200 matangas every day for him. <laughs> <laughs> and who knows what's going to happen? Maybe I'll get to keep my job after this retreat. <laughs> And I want you to test this. That maybe part of walking on water is starting a prayer movement. Starting a prayer movement. I love to read stories of missionaries. It's my favorite thing in the world to do. And there's a book called Secret Believers. And these believers are converts from Islam in Middle Eastern countries. And it's an undercover country in the book. But I actually think it's Egypt, by the way it's described. Because they're working with, you know, Orthodox Church, the guy's name is Amuna, so-and-so, like, I think it was, by the way, literally, that's how, it's in the book, that's how they're describing it. There's Amuna Alexander or whatever. And it's all these stories of people that converted to Christianity in Egypt, I think, and they began to decide they're going to work among the non-Christians of Egypt. And they started, little by little, like, doing little meetings and gathering people and meeting in secret. And then, one of the missionaries, like his wife, got kidnapped. So the missionaries are like, we have to stop. Let's get out of here. And then one of the missionaries said, no way. No way. We are not going to stop. Not every time they hurt one of us, we leave, then the kingdom of God will never be expanded. We're going to stay here. They ended up encouraging each other. And there was a 300,000 person prayer revival going on in Europe. For these, I think there were seven or eight missionaries. Within one year, they had a thousand converts. This movement just started to spread. There was this prayer revival of thousands of people that said, we are going to pray for the missionaries in these Middle Eastern countries whose lives are at risk. But we don't know what's going to happen because stuff is happening. People are in danger and they're getting hurt and kidnapped and whatever and threats. But they've committed to stay. So you know what? If they're going to stay, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to be the person that's going to even if you're the only person praying for the suffering Christians of Iraq, Syria. And something's going to happen. But like, come on. My prayer is going to take down ISIS. You never know. I want you to test. I want you to test the mission of prayer. God is seeking intercessors. If you open up your, you know, Bible, Isaiah 62. Verses 6 and 7. This is my like, favorite thing ever. Isaiah 62 says this. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. Watchmen. Prayer warriors. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord do not keep silent and give Him, meaning God, no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I've set watchmen in Jerusalem, and they are going to give God rest neither day nor night. The command is to bug God 
until you move. Keep pushing until Jerusalem is made a praise on the earth. Until it's a place of glory for Christ. What is your Jerusalem? God is seeking watchmen. He wants watchmen. And maybe getting your feet wet is starting a prayer movement for something on your heart. Find other people that care about it and pray for it. Think about what the Coptic Church did in its prayers for Egypt. Like, who would have thought that in one year, public enemy number one of the Coptic Church, which we thought was going to be there for eight years, one year, what? Nothing will stand against the altar of the Lord. Nothing will stand against the altar of the Lord. People were praying. Every liturgy, every fast that was offered, nothing will get in the way of prayer. We have to believe that. I just want to remind you of the four indicators of where you need to take the first step. The first one is the indicator of fear. Where are you afraid? Maybe that's where you need to take the first step. <clears throat> Second one is frustration. What around you is frustrating you? Third one is compassion. Where do you feel like your heart is moved with compassion? And of course, the fourth one is prayer. It is time to arise. Cafe, enough. You guys agree with me? Enough? Enough. Enough sleeping in the church. Like, enough. Can I get the amen? Amen. Enough. <laughs> if all these people take the first step, I can't wait to see what's going to happen one cop next to you. You hear the stories. 300 people that went and took the first step. And got their feet wet. And were moved by their frustrations and their fears and their compassion. And started a prayer movement. And said, hey, well, what would happen to the Catholic Church? The impact on the world. You want to know what makes my heart so sad? When I talk to converts in the church, they're like, I'm pissed that so I spent years not knowing anything about the truth of Orthodox. How long have you guys been here? 50 years. 50 years? What have you people been doing for 50 years? Where are you? People are burning inside to know Christ and the depths of our spirituality and the truth of our faith. Shh. It's the best kept secret. That's the worst thing in the world. That's the worst thing in the world. Enough must arise. Awake, you who sleep. Awake. I don't want you to leave with just notes that you're going to put in your little spiritual folder that you pull out once it's century. <laughs> you have a challenge. You have indicators of where you need to get your feet wet. You have a six-step process of how to begin to discern the call. You know the consequences of being faithful. And you know what are the qualities of water walkers. How amazing if every person came to me and said, Abuna, I walked on water this year. I actually walked on water. I'm the lad, it took 30 years, it took 28 years. Like, it shouldn't have taken us this long, but now it's okay. Let's do it. Let's jump in. Let's enjoy the presence and the power of God. Let's be part of His kingdom, His mission, for the glory of His name in the world. I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray that this group of people would arise and be infectious. Go infect the people in your church, the people in your neighborhoods, the people in your office. Go infect them. Everybody's like afraid of the two people in America that have Ebola. Everybody's like, anybody that's like, be like, like. <laughs> <laughs> what about the 300 people that have been infected with the love of Christ? They should be just as dangerous. They should be just as dangerous. Especially in this country. We need it more than any other time. Glory to God. We're going to stand and pray. Let's sing a song. Thank you.